and I think uh, Gemma and Philip are joining us by um, Starleaf, and we're expecting Malisha as well, are we? Yep, okay. Fair enough. Uh, members of the, any other apologies? Have we any apologies from Jim Wells? Are we expecting Jim? No, never heard from him. Okay. And it's noticed been. Paul Frey was in the building. I know Paul is in the building. I saw him earlier on, so I'm expecting him to come along as well. Uh, and obviously, I haven't received any notice from any members who has delegated authority to another member to committee to vote under temporary standing order 115. No. Uh, next item on the agenda: declaration of interest. I wish to declare an interest on uh, agenda item 12.2, correspondence uh, from a constituent of mine. And I'll ask the uh, deputy chair to cover that particular piece uh, when he when he's here. Any other declarations of interest? Uh, bearing in mind that all members of the committee may wish to record a declaration of interest in respect to the briefing public service pensions, as all members are indeed in receipt of a pension associated with the ro role as MLAs. Are we agreed to this? Agreed. Agreed? agreed. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to the next item of business, Chairperson is business. Um, I'd just like to uh, start by saying how much uh, I and I know every, every member in this committee abhors the violence against the uh, the young policewoman from the PSNI uh, in the Dungiven area, and we never want to see this kind of thing happening in Northern Ireland ever again. And the fact that this dastardly attack was being committed by sort of uh, by terrorists who were very intent on uh, taking life and potentially the life of our young daughter as well, I think is something that's reprehensible. And I think all of us in the committee would join on that issue as well. Agreed. 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 Uh, the second point is it's Her Majesty's birthday today. And I appreciate it's in a period of mourning, but I think it would be appropriate if we, as a committee, sort of pass, said uh, passed on our respects to Her Majesty on on her birthday. Great. Agreed. 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 Thank you. Uh, next item, uh, and chairperson is business. The ministerial statement. Uh, the minister, during a statement on Tuesday, suggested that the committee should recall land and property services to give oral and written evidence on recovery and repayment issues relating to COVID business support schemes. Is the committee content to include these issues in the scheduled LPS briefing on rates and move this to the 12th of May? Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, when I met the minister informally, he informed me that uh, they are running an innovation lab with social enterprise at some stage, details to be confirmed. And he has asked whether we would like to be represented by a member of our committee on that innovation lab. I think that would be appropriate because it gives us a good indication of what the innovation lab has been doing and also gives us a good uh, input into any future uses of the innovation labs. Are we agreed? Can I just ask, Chair, has the innovation lab been in abeyance during the COVID? Or? No, I think they're scheduling to. Uh, we don't have we don't have a lot of details on it at the moment, but it was uh, the minister was informed. He asked me where we'd be interested, in, and I said yes, we would be. So just so that you're aware of that. Uh, also, uh, there was an informal meeting with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, as the chairperson and the deputy chairperson were unavailable. Um, Peter attended a, the, a meeting with the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee on Thursday, the 15th of April, 2021, on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Members are advised that other statutory committee chairpersons who attended raised practical issues associated with the Northern Ireland Protocol. There was also discussion of political views. The meeting may be reconvened in early June following the anticipated hearings on the Northern Ireland Protocol related court case. A note from the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee on the meeting has been shared with members. Are we content to note, or Jim, do you want to say something? Yeah, I wasn't content at the miserable turnout at that. I think there was two, maybe three chairs. Yeah. There wasn't a single representatives from the unionist community there, uh, and in consequence, um, Mr. Hoare got a very one-sided view of the protocol. I, I can assure you. I, I don't blame him for that. I blame the chairs yeah. who didn't bother to attend. Yeah. Uh, I can rest assured that I, if I had, if I wasn't, if I had a va any availability at all in my diary, I would have actually been at that meeting, but it wasn't possible. Are we agreed? agreed. To note. Uh, draft minutes proceeding to the 14th of April. The draft minutes of the meeting are the 14th of April, page 7. Are we content with the minutes and are an accurate record of proceedings? Say of these, have we agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay. There are no matters arising. Could I ask Assembly Broadcasting to add the witnesses to the spotlight? That's Alison Miller, Desi Laurie, Jim Quinn, and Nulo O'Donnell. Put them all up. 
Just let me know when the gun one. We have three. A three. Where's the rest? Who are we missing? Desi Diary. Desi, yeah. It's not appeared, so maybe one of Is Alison leading on it? Yes, I think so. Okay. Yes. Okay, Alison. Yes, Thanks for asking. Uh, the following witnesses from the Northern Ireland Committee of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions will provide an oral briefing on the views of trade unions on the proposed changes to public sector pensions and the associated and anticipated legislative uh, consent motion. Uh, Alison, are you happy to go ahead? I know I'm still not seeing... Um, I've got Jim up. I think we had Desi. We've just lost him. So we Desi, have, are, you, are you happy, to, con are you, are you happy to continue? Alison. Alison, are you happy to continue? Yeah, yes, sor sorry, uh, Chair. Uh, and ju just in relation to the, the point uh, at the start, just where I come in, don't worry, you weren't breaching any confidences. Uh, that's sort of general knowledge uh, around the Department of Finance. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, to the um, Finance Committee uh, for inviting us along uh, to uh, discuss this issue with you. It's obviously it's very important to scheme members across all of the public sector uh, schemes. Um, so in, in relation to it, uh, I just want to thank the committee for having us here today. Uh, we don't have uh, a whole lot to say. Uh, it is covered in a very brief uh, overview, uh, which we sent to the committee, and I'm sure it's uh, in your packs. I think there's three issues uh, of which we would like to address uh, with the committee. One is in relation to resources, and as I'm sure uh, the committee would be aware, is that as part of the remedy uh, for the age discrimination between 2012 and the uh, uh, and 20, sorry, my phone was ringing there, uh, 2012 and uh, 2022, uh, is that that period of time is that um, needs to be rectified. This will require um, all of the schemes to have sufficient resources within the schemes to allow, as we understand it at this point in time, manual, manual calculations to be made with people who uh, really understand uh, pensions. So um, I think certainly the situation maybe has improved slightly, but we would welcome uh, the intervention of, of the committee to ensure uh, moving forward over the next number of years that all uh, public sector schemes are fully resourced in order to deal with the outworkings uh, of the uh, deferred choice and underpin, which is what all of the unions under the CCWG and uh, collectively and, and separately uh, are agreed that that's the best way to uh, address the issue uh, of the age discrimination that, that uh, appeared during that time. Uh, and I'm sure most of the committee are aware of that. So this means that it's at the point of retirement in which the discriminatory element uh, will be dealt with by way of giving uh, choices to uh, scheme members when they come up for retirement. So you would get, uh, had you stayed in the legacy scheme, this would be your option. And um, had you moved to the new scheme, this would be your option and then people can have an options choice at that point in time. And I th we think that's the best way uh, to handle uh, the issue. That leads me on to the issues around potential tax issues that arise out of the deferred choice uh, underpin. Um, and the issue is that it, while um, in simple terms is that, and this doesn't just apply to high earners, this would apply to uh, people across uh, the public sectors in all schemes is that what might appear uh, when you retire, you will get, you know, if it's dead in this scheme, this would be the amount of lump sum and pension you would receive. And in the, um, in the other uh, scheme, this is what the lump sum and pension you would receive. And most people being human beings will opt for the scheme that delivers them the, the best lump sum and the best pension. However, um, we're all human beings. We all have our own uh, issues um, and tax issues. And we believe, given the age discrimination um, was not caused by scheme members, that um, the government, and whether that's the Assembly, but more likely to be the Westminster government, should pay for the age discrimination. Because we're not blaming 
uh, the Assembly uh, or the Finance Committee of the day in relation to this issue because this was something that was implemented uh, at a UK level and therefore we believe that uh, when people come to retirement that they should be get free independent um, financial advice to ensure they make the best uh, decision and choice which suits them not just at the point of retirement but throughout uh, the rest of their, their lives in the uh, and as long as they live. So I think that's a, a really important issue because I'm sure that the committee would agree is that, you know, if if government uh, makes a mistake, then it shouldn't be the scheme members who then have to pay for that. And what we want to ensure uh, over the lifetime of this going forward, that um, people are given proper tax advice so that they don't end up making uh, a further uh, decision that impacts on them financially. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Jim Quinn, who's going to address the issue of the LCM. Okay. Jim. Thanks, Thank you, uh, First of all, I'd like to thank the committee for taking the time. Um, it's important to our members, particularly people in the Harvard Gate Union. Uh, we are the people who have been, either rightly or wrongly, uh, blamed for bringing this case across and uh, all the outcomes of what's happened uh, since it's uh, been resolved. Um, our chief concern with the legislative consent motion is one of the legislation actually about pensions was devolved and was dealt with in the Assembly back in 2014, 2012 and dealt with via primary legislation. We believe um, initially anyway that that should be examined and we should be going through the same process again. It allows for better scrutiny, it allows for more transparency and it allows for not iron specific changes that may be required. And I say may be required because we're unaware of what the Westminster proposals are. They're not due out until we believe sometime around about May or June time. So until that happens, we're not going to know exactly what the proposals are. And if an LCM is used, then our question, a big question is, because we're not legislators, if you use an LCM to bring in the changes to remove discrimination, as the Minister points out, it needs to be done. Our question then is, what of amendments are made to peculiarities about Northern Ireland specific schemes or issues that aren't in uh, GB? How will that be done? Is it done by uh, another LCM from Westminster? Can local politicians through the Assembly amend that? We're not sure. And uh, part of the reason the Minister gave was about delaying the removal of discrimination. Our fear would be that we don't get it right the first time. Mind that there'll be a longer delay if we find there's issues that have been left out or issues that need amended. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg what would cause the delay. So we understand you now at the minute the LCM is the way forward for the uh, Department of Finance and the Minister. And what we're asking for is that they have a, look, a closer look at that to see if it is the most appropriate way and the best way to amend the legislation to remove discrimination. So it may be some help from the Finance Committee or others who will be able to tell us what would happen if an LCM is enacted and we do find that there's a deficiency in it. In, in that it doesn't address some of the NIA specific issues. Can that be re-amended? Will it take a longer period of time? Uh, what happens if the uh, House is in session in Westminster and here? Will that cause further delay? So, well, in giving any answers to that, we're, we're probably asking more questions. But essentially, we don't believe at this moment in time because we haven't got enough information that the LCM would be the most appropriate way, either for transparency or for scrutiny, and more importantly, for getting the whole thing right rather than trying to get it through quickly. That's really all we've got to say on that matter at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much indeed, and thanks very much indeed for uh, for your statements. Look, a couple of questions here to just ask through. Um, obviously, with the um, cloud pensions reforms uh, and your suggestion that we should proceed through the Northern Ireland Assembly via primary legislation rather than the legislative consent motion, now that's what I'm sort of um, taking from you, Jim. Are you arguing for primary legislation because it wants the Assembly to amend the Westminster legislation, or do you want us to run as, as a primary legislation, or what are, particularly are you trying to secure? And if you were, what amendments would you like us to try and secure? Well, the whole problem is we're not aware of what the Westminster legislation is going to be, and what the changes are from the LCM, and we do have differences in Northern Ireland different schemes. Uh, we have cross-border bodies, which is what we don't have in, in, in GB. So there are potentially um, issues that may not be able to be addressed by the English, uh, uh, sorry, the Westminster uh, LCM. Although in saying that, it could be just a simple way 
of getting the, the higher level uh, changes made and the local stuff could be dealt with. We're not sure. But also, uh, because we have got evolution of pensions, we do believe it should be in the hands of local politicians in case those sorts of issues need to be addressed and the people on the ground can't speak directly to yourselves like we are now. And that would make for an easier, more succinct, more transparent and possibly and probably a more accurate and speedy resolution to the process. So there's a number of reasons why we're doing that, but probably mostly because we're in the dark about what the LCM will contain exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, uh, the Department of Finance has argued that if the executive brought forward its own pensions reform bill, which deviated from the Westminster legislation, such an approach would leave the executive liable to legal challenge from public, ser public sector pension members in Northern Ireland. Whereas if the executive simply replicates the Westminster legislation, prospective plaintiffs are more likely to challenge HM Treasury in the courts. Would you accept that argument? There's a potential for that, but I, I don't accept that that would be a, a reason for going down that route. We're not suggesting that we want any special or different treatment. We're just suggesting that to make a full and proper assessment of what's going on, that we need, one, to see the legislation, and two, for our local politicians to see if it fits in with their view of what local pensions should look like. And I don't think that we're going to be jumping on some sort of um, train to try and take them back to court if they, if they go down that route. That's not our intention. Our intent is quite clearly to get this right and get it right properly. And I think that if you consider uh, enacting legislation, which we don't know exactly what the impact would be, if there are any known iron peculiarities, that that's a, a reasonable position to take. And of course, if the LCN can go through and covers all the bases, then I'm sure that um, that could be dealt with by the Assembly as well, looking at it before they decide whether to take it through primary or follow the English or the Westminster LCM. So I think it's still time to do one or the other. Okay, thanks for answering. Jim? Um, first of all, once again, can I declare my chairmanship of the Northern Ireland Assembly Members' Pension Scheme and membership of the Trustees for 17 years. Um, I don't know if you've been following the evidence, the very clear evidence we've been receiving from the Department on this issue. I think the committee has really gone into this in considerable depth. Um, are you aware that, uh, I'm sure you are aware, that Wales and Scotland have decided to go down the legislative consent route, and really they feel that there's absolutely no option of having a bespoke uh, legislation for their own particular jurisdiction. Uh, given that, and given the fact that the Treasury have made it very clear that if we were to step out of that route, that we as a, a Northern Ireland block grant would have to meet that extra expenditure, what is the merit <coughs> in separate legislation when really our hands are tied? I think, Mr. Wells, we're actually what we're, what we're asking for is not necessary to, to blindly refuse to use an LCM. When Westminster publishes the LCM, I think there's, there will be some time, I'm not completely afraid of the parliamentary process or procedure. There may be time before that to assess whether an LCM is appropriate and the measures taken in the, the GBA LCM would suit um, Northern Ireland pensions. All we're saying is there may be Northern Ireland peculiarities. Um, we did take a session back uh, 2012 2014 to proceed in some different ways to our GB colleagues on certain pension schemes. And we just want to be sure that those particular peculiarities can be addressed through the LCM uh, if necessary. We're not suggesting that for the sake of it, we just go through um, a process here different in Northern Ireland. Um, it may be that the LCM is the most appropriate route, but what we're saying about it, we haven't seen it, we don't know what's in it, and we would prefer that the, the local assembly would scrutinise that, whether it's the LCM process itself first or whether it's by using primary legislation. I think. Uh, that remains to be seen. We have to, we have said it or said there that we want it through primary legislation. But if presumably if the LCM itself covered all the cases, further discussions could take place, and that may be something that we can reflect on and uh, come back and uh, speak to the final about. Sorry, just sorry, just one second, sir. Um, sir, I've, part of the conversation you've mentioned a couple of times now about Northern Ireland specific peculiarity or peculiarities of the Northern Ireland pension schemes. Could you outline what those peculiarities are? Because that would probably help us in sort of formulating our thoughts. Well, I agree. I agree. I on the fire brigade scheme, which we know we have a different retirement age to the rest of our colleagues in the GB. That's one example. 
Now, I presume that's not going to be impacted upon by LCM, but I, I couldn't be sure. I also understand that we have some um, peculiarities when we have um, cross-border bodies who people are um, employed by that may not have the same um, conditions or the same legislation issues that are required uh, in GV. So all we're saying is that there are peculiarities or differences. I'm not aware of all of them, but it would be it would be pertinent to have a look at that LCM to see if there are any differences that um, we need to, to reflect on and, and have a closer look at. Uh, so I couldn't really in the world, to be frank, but there's two, for example. Okay, thanks. Jim, sorry. Chair, person, could I, could I come in on this point? Yes, certainly. Yeah, I think the issue is uh, for the all of the trade unions and all of the scheme members at this point in time, it's like, you know, hold your nose and, you know, jump into something. And I think anybody uh, would accept and everybody should accept the fact until we see the Westminster legislation um, and the read across through an LCM um, is that, you know, we just are nervous at this point in time that we would potentially just agree to an LCM uh, blindfolded when we haven't seen the legislation. So maybe a suggestion from the CCWG trade unions would be whenever we see the Westminster legislation and what the LCM may look like, then either we would come back and address the committee or if we have no issues and are content for it to go through an LCM, then that could be done by correspondence if that you know helps the committee. Yeah, because I think that we're, we're like yourselves. We, we don't know what's, what's going to be in it. Yeah. And one of the questions we've asked and sort of we've asked a sort of uh, out of committee and I've asked uh, sort of uh, the clerk is, you know, what's the timelines? Because we mm -hmm. don't know what the timeline is. One of the things I'm going to be asking the committee after this is write to the department to get us an update on the timelines and when it's likely to be. Uh, yeah, and again, the, the latest, Chair, sorry for cutting across you, the, the latest information we have um, it, uh, you know, in asking the questions ourselves of the department is that, you know, maybe late May, but it could be June. Uh, so I think that demonstrates that there's no clear timeline at this point in time. And yeah. then, you know, we're fearful of the summer recess then kicking in and then there'll be a very short time frame. So for all those reasons, you know, we haven't made a final decision, you know, that we're wed, absolutely wed at the primary legislation. We don't want to... Um, really determine primary legislation or an LCM without all of the full facts. And I think I think we're agreeable on that. Yeah. Okay. Chair. Jim, sorry. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's very helpful, that, uh, that reaction, Alison, I have to say. Can I just explain some of the technical issues at this end? The Speaker has ruled that no legislation can be tabled in the Assembly after June, as far as getting it through during this mandate is concerned. And indeed, legislation tabled in June will be doing very well to get through. Uh, this assembly before we, we, we dissolve for an election. Uh, so therefore, um, if we don't go down the LCM route, the difficulty is the witching hour here, of course, is the 31st of March 2022, uh, when those who will pick... Sorry, I don't know whether other people can hear, but Jim's cutting out quite a bit, and we're only getting... I have to say, no one has complained that they couldn't hear me in my entire political career. <laughs> <laughs> they, they might have complained the that they quite the opposite. Yeah, yes, they <laughs> might have complained that they could hear me, but not that they couldn't. Um, uh, Alison, can you? <laughs> I can. If you're having problems with Jim, I can ask Jim to come and move a bit closer to me because I can self disinfect my spot and move on, Jim, well, if you I'm want to. Unless my colleagues can hear, okay, and that's the problem's my end. No, 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 no. Jim, do you want to try again? Uh, so. Can anybody hear me? It, it's very Dalek. It's, it's really like a Dalek sort of um, No, that's him. Oh. <laughs> 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 but, but but do you want to try the one at the end? Yeah. Jim, try the one at the end. Just, if you just allow us one second just to allow our honourable member from uh, South Down to manoeuvre. This is with a permanent secretary. He normally sits. Yeah. Um, yes. you those short, so. <laughs> I wish I had his salary. Can, can you hear me now? Good. Yes. Right. yes. Now, just to, to go back and say, as far as our own position is concerned, the Speaker has ruled that no legislation received after June can possibly get through. He won't accept it because it won't get through in time during this mandate. So our, our difficulty here is that the witching hour, as far as this legislation is concerned, is the 31st of March 2022, when all of those who are entitled to be upgraded to 
the final salary scheme will be upgraded to that date, and then everyone is going to go on to the same scheme as a result of the McLeod judgment. So the danger is, if we go down the primary legislation route, we won't be able to have it through in time for that crucial date. Secondly, could I just say is that we'll be watching the LCM very carefully, and if we spot anything of the concerns that you've raised, we also would be taking that up with the department. We're not going to, we're not going to blindly rubber stamp something. It's still up to this assembly as to whether or not we accept the LCM motion. So it's not, it's not a done deal in that sense. But it would be very difficult for us to backtrack, given the fact that all the other legislations in the UK are going in one way and one way only. Alison? Yeah, uh, yes, and I think that's, that's helpful, is that, um, that you've said. And, and we understand the issues and about the timing about this. And I think certainly there's concerns uh, on the committee side uh, and with ourselves. Is let's see the Westminster legislation. We're not fundamentally opposed to an LCM, but what we don't want to do is say today is that, yes, it's an LCM in case there's something when we see the Westminster legislation that we think it's imperative uh, that we bring to your attention and obviously to the Department of Finance's attention. Um, so if we could, I, th I think, leaving that space open that we can either correspond with you or come back to the committee. My fear is, is that the Westminster legislation is going to come out potentially just before the summer recess and then where does that leave us all and i think even on a uk level uh, at westminster is that's leaving uh, everything very tight so you know we're not wedded one way or the other we just want to see it to ensure as i'm sure the committee does to ensure that there's not something in it that would disadvantage in any way any scheme member in the northern Ireland schemes given this is i think we're relying upon you if you do spot something to let us know we have already been ha an issue raised with police officers who are unhappy with what's happening, and there may be others out there who are in a similar situation. But I know, you know you're sharp and you'll spot something. You'll let us know individually as, as a committee. Uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're not trying to steamroll this through either, because we had to discuss whether we went down this route or not. But the evidence we received from the department was overwhelming that we had to go down this route unless something dramatically changed. Thanks, Jim. Alicia. Thank you. Can they have musical chairs for you? Can you sanitize it? Oh, my sir. Hello. I'm not sorry. I think King Chair, my questions have been answered. So okay. I'm going to turn about the timing. Okay. Thanks very much, sir. Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's really just further to some of Jim's questions around um, the. Um, and also the chairs around the anomalies that are Northern Ireland specific. Um, you mentioned that you know uh, that you're not opposed to the principle of um, an LCM, but that there are specific. I suppose, Alison, perhaps could you give just a, an overview of what you think those specific issues are, and then what are the what are the what are the ones that are top of your mind that you're concerned about? Well, I think certainly uh, Jim has addressed those certainly in relation to two schemes. One is the cross-border uh, body scheme, yeah. and say different retirement ages in the um, in the fire scheme that that isn't the same as the um, the Westminster uh, legislation. So maybe it would be better um, because we don't have all of the schemes obviously between the four of us here today okay. representative and I think maybe the best way to, to address your your question um, Mr O'Toole would be to to write uh, on behalf of the CCWG okay. yeah. and we'd get that letter into you in the next week or two. That would be really helpful but can I just I can just confirm that the I mean much as I would like it you're, 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 you're not your hope is not that we Amend primary legislation that we have the primary legislation here amended to make it, for example, materially m more generous. Much as a good social democrat, I like to be able to do that. But your that your ask is not that we are going to that we have our own primary legislation in order that we diverge in a in terms of much greater generosity. Is it? What, what, we're, what we're actually hoping and what we anticipate is that the northern that the this legislation should be very narrow legislation because yeah. it's not to address the whole public sector 2014 schemes. Mm -hmm. So therefore, issues that may be specific to specific schemes, like the fire scheme having a different 
retirement age, like the cross-border body scheme being slightly different, is that we don't believe the Westminster legislation should touch any of those. It should just be on the actual remedy. And if that is the case, the remedy should be the same across the four nations. And therefore, we would be, I believe we would be content at that point in time that an LCM could address that. Okay. If it's stretched wider than that, then that's where our concern is. Do you know if the, if the minister is writing to, if, the, if, if it's the Department of Finance's preference that it's not, that they just do an LCM, and is the minister aware of these specific concerns, and is he writing to, you know, Treasury or whomever to, to make sure that you know what you've described it doesn't happen? Well, certainly we have raised that um, through the uh, negotiating machinery, the CCWG, with the management side. Uh, we have made that very clear. Certainly, the information we're getting is that's the expectation of the senior staff in the department. Uh, that this would only be to address a very narrow focus on this, but we're, we're suspicious around the whole pension is issue, and we just want to make sure okay. that it doesn't stray into areas that would be detrimental to any scheme member in Northern Ireland outside of the age discrimination element. Okay, that's what I should declare retrospectively. I'm a UK civil service as well as my assembly pension. I'm a UK civil service pension holder. I should require. I should also. Uh, just Declare retrospectively, I hold a pension from the Ministry of Defence. Both, both You'll be claiming your sooner than me, Chair. I should, isn't that? <laughs> so not strong, substantial yeah. enough. Right. Okay. Sorry, Pat. Um, well, just there's no one else coming in. I was going to ask just on the back of that, when you said that the four just come out from the four nations uh, should be, you're saying that that should be the same ruling for all. But I noticed the departments indicated that a further evaluation of public sector pension is underway. How do you, well, how does that sit with, with your analysis there earlier, Alison, that it was going to be across the four nations? Yeah, well, scheme valuations are, are a different matter, um, and that sort of mentioned in, in paragraph three of the short briefing note. Uh, at this point in time, our our position is uh, across all of the schemes is that um, if there's a cost to uh, correcting McLeod uh, and the age discrimination element, then that should not be picked up by um, by, by scheme members. Uh, so in some of the schemes for 2016, is that valuations had been done, and in certainly in the schemes that that I have knowledge of. Uh, is that uh, there was um, improvements for scheme members, such as um, a, a better accrual rate uh, and some changes to death and service benefits. So, for example, in the civil service scheme. Um, but that was replicated across a number of schemes, and some of my colleagues may want to come in and give you some examples of that. Um, I've just been uh, very recently made aware um, that... Uh, the actual cost, say, for example, in the civil service scheme, and we're only starting to get this information, so we don't have it across all schemes. The cost of rectifying McLeod um, in the civil, Northern Ireland civil service pension scheme would be in the region of 4.8%. Uh, so therefore, those better accrual rates and better death and service benefits that were part of the 2016 valuation that was not implemented, that was halted, uh, therefore, it's very clear to be seen that uh, scheme members are now going to be asked to take um, the hit in relation to uh, paying for something that was not of their fault. Uh, and obviously, we'll want to study that in more detail uh, as the valuations come out for each of the schemes. And I think certainly we will be writing to the committee when we have you know, a concrete position uh, on this, because I'm sure... Uh, you would all agree is that you know if somebody else does something wrong that you have no control over, then you shouldn't be asked to pay for it. Uh, ultimately, and that is the trade union side's position. But we're just starting to get those scheme valuations. And again, I would suggest when we have a clearer picture across all schemes, that we would write to the committee and we would be more than content to come back to address any specifics around those valuations. Alison, but that some of, some of my colleagues, you know, would have. Uh, more detailed knowledge, you know, Desi would have detailed knowledge of the um, of the health scheme and may be able to articulate, you know, some of the information there, if that's helpful. 
Um, Alison, yes. just a quick. Alison Desi, you said 4.8 per cent. Is that only? Is that 4.8 per cent of those who are likely to be affected by Macleod, or is that a 4.8 per cent of the overall pension uh, budget? How? What is that 4.8 per cent specifically related to? That is related to what they call a floor breach or a um, a ceiling breach. So uh, if it's two, if it's more than two percent below or two percent above, then um, th then it needs to be addressed. At this point in time, the valuation is coming out in the civil service scheme at five point three, but it's four point eight percent is the remedy of um, McLeod. So therefore, rather than uh, 2016, because the valuation had been done for the civil service scheme, is that scheme members would have benefited certainly until the next valuation, is that they're now not getting the benefit of that. Um, again, I'll provide you with maybe a, a written explanation of that, but Desi, I think, is on the yes. State Advisory Board, and Health and, uh, would be over the detail better than me. Chairman, uh, apologies for the technology to start. The rehearsals went well, but yeah. uh, unfortunately, when I went to execute, it didn't go so well earlier on, but it's a great opportunity to address the committee. In, t in terms of the Health uh, Scheme Advisory Board, I co-chair it along with the management representative. And in 2008, November 2008, after uh, the scheme was assessed and the costs were analysed, we, we were in a position to make recommendations to the minister that, for firstly, that um, we, would, we would change the, the way in which we harvest the, the money, we base that on actual pay rather than whole time equivalents to make it much fairer to those active members. We also uh, sought to index link the, the boundaries regarding uh, scheme contributions. So there are seven bands. So we wanted to index them so that if, say, somebody moved from one band to another, they, they didn't uh, end up with a pay cut as a result of a higher uh, contribution rate. And also, we wanted to take out the last three bands uh, or higher bands and migrate them to a rate of 12.5%. Uh, and that was part, uh, trying to improve the particularly medical and dental retention in the scheme. Uh, and also in terms of survival benefits, we also had made recommendations that all active members would equalise uh, as of the 1st of April uh, 2015. And we also had room uh, uh, to also uh, make recommendations about reducing the contribution rate across the board by 1% and also to increase uh, a new benefit uh, which would build up cash for a lump sum. So they were quite important. Uh, and as Alison said, the, there is a cost benefit uh, now being readdressed by valuations and the government actuarial department are uh, analysing the data. We haven't seen that data, but if uh, if it is taken into account that we have to actually, members have to actually pay for McLeod and we need something like uh, estimated about 34 new staff working within pension administration uh, to be able to support that and that's not counting the departmental staff that is required and you can actually see you know the the the, the members will have to have to pay for that and we in principle are, are against that we're not we're not uh, in any way uh, saying that the direction order per se is wrong. We're just specifically saying that the cost cap recovery uh, for McLeod is is inappropriate. As and as you can see, those benefits would be, we we were recommending to the minister in November two thousand and eighteen have the potential to be wiped out uh, if we cover the costs for uh, McLeod. But I mean that's a, it's, it's an issue. Until we see the data, we will not know. Okay, thanks. Jim, you want to come back in? There's a world of a difference between 1% and 1% each point. 1% each point is actually a 9% increase uh, levy on the exchequer, if you can understand the difference. If I go from 2% to 3%, that is not a 1% each point increase. That is a 50% increase, if you understand the difference. So whilst it sounds attractive saying 1%, it's not. It's 1% each point which is much, much higher. Secondly, as far as our own trustees are concerned, uh, what we're simply doing, we're asking members to pay exactly to the last penny 
but they would have paid had they been allowed to remain in the final salary scheme. In other words, had they remained in the scheme, their contributions would have been 12% rather than 9%. So what we have done is we have gone back to the 1st of April 2015 and said, what if Emily Smith had, or Jones had stayed in the final salary scheme? What would he or she have paid? Now, that is reasonable because they would have paid that money anyhow to accrue those benefits. They had the choice whether to stay in the final salary scheme or to have gone into uh, the career average scheme. Now, what is unreasonable then of asking civil servants to pay exactly what they would have paid had they been allowed to stay in the final salary scheme? Chairman, one of, one of the difficulties is that across, across health uh, there is two effective pension schemes. Uh, the 1995 and 2008 make up one scheme and then the 2015. Once you get into um, significant uh, issues around administration, uh, our advice coming from uh, the pension scheme administrator was it was going to be very, very difficult to uh, state that if we had pension contributions that were changed from 1995, a different one for 2008 and 2015. So we have always taken the view, and it was across both the management and trade union side, that we should have the same contribution rate no matter what scheme you were involved in. Even though the final salary scheme is so much more lucrative and attractive than when you retire, are you saying you shouldn't pay an extra uh, contribution towards that? Uh, well, the, the reality of the situation is the 1995 scheme, which is the final salary scheme, will end. Uh, you know, members will still benefit from contributions, but under under the new direction, uh, as a result of the consultation, they will move over uh, those that are still working uh, to the 2015 scheme. Uh, well, I think the department will find it very hard to justify that those who have been taken out of a final salary scheme and then put back into it don't then, are not then asked to pay the amount they would have paid anyhow had, had, had there not been the decision that McLeod overturned. So, so therefore, you know, what you're saying is you're going, to get in, you're going to get seven years' worth of a final salary scheme, but we're not going to ask you to pay for it. I think we, we, no assembly could stand over that. I'm sorry, I just couldn't. Chair, can I come in there? Please? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the teacher scheme is very different in relation to that. The contribution rates for all teachers were increased under the 2014 Act and basically to get an average of 9.6% across, depending on um, what salary you were in receipt of. So it would be anything from 7% right up to 11 um, depending on the salary you were receiving. That increased from 6.4% to whichever point you were on in the scale. And that was irrelevant. To whether you were in the final, you remained in the final salary scheme or in the the, the care scheme. So I think one of the issues here is that all the public sector schemes are actually very different. The teacher scheme is actually much more simple um, compared to some of the others that, that I was part of. But I think there's no issue that that regardless of whether you were in the um, final salary or the care scheme within this, you would be paying exactly the same contributions and have been since this was introduced when they were all increased in 2015. Thanks very much, Jim. Do you want to come back in, Jim Quinn? Yeah, I mean, you notice hit the nail on the head. The schemes are all very different. Firefighters pay fifteen percent in the old scheme, and what Mr. Wells says would be correct. We'll be expected to have to recoup um, that additional payment uh, compared to the new scheme. The new scheme is quite ten or twelve percent, depending on what, what salary you earn. And if we buy back into the old scheme, the legacy scheme, not buy back, but we're put back in, we will have to give the money back that uh, the contributions should have been, i.e., fifteen percent. But to go back to the real point about the cost cap evaluation, the Fairbanks Union are taking further legal action on this. We've issued judicial review proceedings, essentially because the cost control mechanisms are relating to the cost of the 2015 scheme. The cost of correcting discrimination relates to the pre-2015 schemes. And what the government are trying to do is make the people in the, the post-2015 schemes pay for the discrimination. And uh, that's not what the government intended in 2014 when the cost control mechanisms were debated and passed through Westminster. So we believe it's potentially unlawful and uh, that we're still challenging that element of it because you essentially make a one group of people who are not benefiting 
pay for the cost of someone else's benefit, and then it's it's essentially not fair and potentially unlawful. So that's the, the differences I see it. Okay, thanks, Jim. Thanks very much today. Okay, anybody else? Okay, uh, thanks very much, today. Just before I finish, um, just a quick one, sorry, Alison. Uh, obviously, we have heard reports that the uh, Northern Ireland Civil Service pay deal is to be around about one percent. I just wondered if you'd like to make any sort of comment about that, and also uh, the development about. I think the minister was talking about working from home post-pandemic policy for the civil service, and have you any views on that as well? Okay. Yes. Just um, in relation to the civil service pension, or sorry, uh, pay, is that um, just in the last few days we've been made an offer of one percent plus a one percent non-consolidated payment for 2020, 2021, and a one percent. The this is the broad bones off at one percent uh, for 21, 22. Um, the representations that. Uh, NIPSA and the FDA made to the, directly to the minister was on the basis that we were looking at parity with our teacher colleagues, who certainly for 2020, 20, I, I forget what years we're in sometimes, 2020, 2021, is that they got a 2% uh, consolidated offer. Um, and we were looking for the same uh, applicability that uh, didn't didn't materialise. Uh, civil servants are very disappointed that we're currently now out to a branch consultation, which will close on the 14th of May with members uh, in relation to uh, the current offer. Um, and we we are, at, I must admit, uh, you know, I've asked the minister on a number of occasions uh, at meetings and in writing, what is the difference uh, and what difference has teachers who have played a very important role through the last uh, year in education of our children and in the very difficult circumstances. What's the difference to that than civil servants? And I think that's the thing that sticks uh, in the throat of, of many civil servants who have um, went above and beyond uh, in relation to uh, the pandemic and continued to um, provide services. So uh, any uh, You've asked the question, so if the Finance Committee uh, want to make those representations to the Minister and to the Executive, we would be uh, very grateful for that. In relation to the working from home uh, post-pandemic, is that uh, we're now, I think, on our second uh, draft of a working from home policy, uh, which we're working intensely with. Uh, another a revised copy just arrived with us yesterday, and we're working intensely with the management side to try to uh, top and tail that, and we would be uh, hopeful that that will be implemented in the very near future. Um, and we're content that you know we're, we're making progress on issues to ensure that whether it's a blended approach, uh, whether it addresses issues for people who don't want to uh, work at home or can't work from home, is that all of those issues uh, are addressed, including uh, one of the issues that's sort of a, a bit of a thorny issue, is the fact that. Uh, for many members uh, working from home, there's additional costs, particularly during the, the winter months of heating. Uh, and as you know, about 12,500 civil servants are below £24,000. Uh, and therefore, heating their homes uh, while working at home has been very difficult for some. Uh, and uh, we would be hoping that we can uh, crack that nut because we haven't been able to do so to date. But I want to assure the committee that NIPSA is working intensely with the management side on a working from home policy so that um, the new world of work that we uh, thought was never going to be realised when we asked previously about working from home, for, that we were told no. But there is a significant number uh, of members who, um, like for example, in the Department of Communities, my understanding there's about 3,000 uh, of about 8,000 staff in on a very regular basis, on a daily basis. But I want to assure the committee uh, that we're working intensely on a working, uh, well, we're saying a working from home policy. I think it's remote working because it's not about necessarily working at home. It's about working at home or working in the hubs that are being developed across Northern Ireland. Okay, thanks. Jim, come back in. Yeah, just <coughs> going on from that, um, the next briefing we have is from the department in respect of the uh, reform management programme. I was just wondering, has the 
Have the unions a view about that in terms of the impact of the pandemic on the needs of the departments in terms of its office estate and indeed the Connect hubs? Um, is, are the unions or is the department working with the unions on this or, or, or what is your take on it all? Yeah, through the through the central Whitley uh, arrangements, uh, there's what's called an accommodation committee. So those are rightfully the place where all of the issues around accommodation, the hubs. I mean, for example, we have made uh, commentary uh, and representations in relation to uh, in that sort of Middlester area and the sort of the Macrofelt Middlester area. There's no hub there, um, and. You know, we think that could be beneficial both to the department and to, to workers who live in that area going forward. So we're actively engaged in seeking to address, obviously, the needs of the, of our members first and foremost, but also what are the needs uh, of the civil service in the new world in which we are working in all of those issues. And we just want to ensure that the issues do come to us um, in the appropriate um, time for meaningful uh, consultation rather than when decisions have been taken. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Alison. And thank you very much indeed for your team for coming along. And thank you very much indeed for your taking your time. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you. Assembly Broadcast, if, thank you can, you. if you can take the witnesses off spotlight, please. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, team. Uh, the department has not, uh, as we heard, the department has not specified a timescale for the introduction of the LCM. It may be expected before summer recess, but this is dependent on progress of the parent uh, of the parent Westminster legislation. Uh, members would be content whether we wish to set out a view in respect of the uh, NIC ICTU's arguments that primary legislation is needed, or should we be looking to see whether it's uh, wait and see what's coming from Westminster and see what's in the LCM? Go ahead, Jim. Mr. Chairman, I think this committee has given this an incredibly detailed scrutiny. Um, uh, what I would say is that, because of the issues I've outlined already, I believe we must wait until the legislative yeah. consent motion comes through Westminster. We must take mm -hmm. on board any concerns that the trade unions have, uh, and then make a decision as to the best way forward. But the balance of probabilities is very much that we're going to go down the LCM route mm -hmm. for the reasons I've outlined. That we don't—I don't believe we have time now for premier legislation to get this invoked before the deadline of March 2022. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? I agree, yeah, Malaysia. Go ahead. I I agree with Mr. Wells on that, Chair. Here. I think we have to see just what's coming out of Westminster. Can I change my idea? Mm -hmm. Gemma, did you have your hand up? No, but I, I do agree with uh, both Malaysia and Jim Wells there on that. Just to wait and see what's coming from Westminster. Okay. Okay, then, Tim. If, if we're content uh, to write to the department seeking further information on the public sector pension revaluation process and related time skills as well as the time scales for the LCM. So let's write to the department and see if they can get some inf more information out of Westminster. I know they've been trying, but I'd do it as well. Chair, just to clarify on time scales for legislation, what the speaker indicated was that the, I think it's the 11th of June mm -hmm. date refers to private members' uh, bills only. Uh, there's no deadline on executive uh, bills. I, I accept that, Clark, uh, but he also stated the difficulty Thank that the Assembly would face in getting anything through if it was received after the 9th of June, particularly a substantive piece of legislation like this. And we have to have a cut-off date where it's unlikely, given the amount of business that's coming up and the summer recess, that we'll really get it through. So we need to have a very good reason why we don't go down the LCM route here. Mm -hmm. I think also charges for members' information that the bill could be taken by accelerated passage. If you wanted to do that route, it could be done that way. Um, not that I'm suggesting that you should, mm. but you do have that option. Then you wouldn't have the scrutiny. Well, uh, <laughs> indeed, uh, or you could have a short committee stage, um, but that would be uh, it, that would be tricky because we know we have at least four executive bills coming our direction uh, in the autumn. Uh, when the LCM comes, as members know, there will be a fairly sort of short motion, but I anticipate the bill will be on the back of it and that will be laid. Uh, so there will be the committee will then have fifteen working days to produce a report um, and it may then choose to propose whatever it wants to propose. Um, but it would be a question then so then the, the minister would have a choice. Um, go for the legislative consent motion, um, potentially have the executive the, the assembly reject that or 
say, OK, then we're not have a legislative consent motion, I'll bring forward primary legislation, or not, or just go down the primary leg uh, the uh, legislative consent motion route, as seems to be um, uh, the case. Could I also ask, sorry, Chair, I'll stop talking, could I also ask if the committee is content to write to Nick Ek to and just ask them to explicitly set out... Sorry, the, yes, it's explicitly set out what the peculiarities were, because that yeah. was mentioned several times, and when we asked the question again. what the peculiarities were, I didn't... Well, I think it boiled down to two specific things. One was um, cross-border border. Cross border pension schemes. I can understand there would be particular legalities there, and the other one is different ages for the fire scheme. They seem relatively discrete issues that could be... Uh, I know there are specific differences between the sort of within the uh, health service pensions and sort of within the teachers' pensions. There are specific differences okay. in there, and yeah. I understand there's peculiarities between that and sort of the schemes in England, Scotland and Wales as well. Equally, Mr Chair, I, I will die in the ditch over this issue that people should not be placed back in exactly the same position it would have been had they stayed within a final salary scheme. Mm -hmm. They can't have their cake and eat it. They can't go back into a final salary scheme and then refuse to pay the additional contributions that they would have paid had they stayed in it. Yeah, I mean, that's but just I'm a crucial... That's a, that's a fun, I mean, the Department will laugh us out of court if we support that. It just yeah. can't be done. But you can't go back into... Um, my understanding is if you're going back into the final salary pension scheme, you have to pay the, the, yeah. the delta. It's an extra... Probably an extra three percentage point increase, not 3%, 3 percent, 3 percentage points. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Dukes. Uh, there we go. Uh, sorry. I was saying as the committee content to write to the department seeking further information on the public sector pension revaluation process, the related time scales as well as the intended time scales for the LCM. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Move on to the next item of the agenda. Uh, can we uh, have the officials to come into spotlight to the Department of Finance? And it's Derek Kennedy. Derek? Yay! How are you? Good to, good to see you. Uh, so, our team, we're having a briefing now on the Department of Finance Reform of Property Management. Uh, the Department will brief the Committee on the Reform of Property Management Programme and the Connect to Regional Hubs. Uh, Derek Kennedy, uh, who is the senior responsible owner of the Reform of uh, Property Management Programme. Clark's cover notice at page 62. The written ministerial statement on Connect to Regional Hubs at page 67. The NIAO report managing the Central Government Office of States at page 70, and the Northern Ireland Asset Management Strategy at page 134. Uh, you might uh, just like to draw your attention to page 120 of the meeting packs, which the absence of any written material from the Department sets out the Northern Ireland Audit Office summary of the reform of uh, property management programme. Derek, would you like to make your opening statement, please? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. I'm Derek Kennedy, Senior Responsible Owner of the Reform of Property Management Programme. I'd like to thank the Committee for this opportunity to provide you with an overview of the programme and the progress that we've made to date since the Committee was last briefed, uh, and address any questions that you may have. The Reform of Property Management Programme was established to assist in the delivery of the objectives of the Executive's Asset Management Strategy, namely to reduce the net cost of service delivery through the efficient use of public assets and to promote effective asset management process, processes that unlock value. The program's goal is to be an efficient, value-adding, property-shared service for central government. And successful delivery of the established program promotes a number of program for government outcomes. Namely, we live and work sustainably, protecting the environment. We have high-quality public services. We've created a place where people want to live and work, to visit and invest. We connect people through. We connect people and opportunities through our infrastructure. We prosper through a strong, competitive, regionally balanced economy. In 2018, the program introduced a new approach to investment planning across the estate. Historically, investment in the estate was reactive, dictated by a number of factors, including availability and/or scarcity of funding, single-year budgets, an aging estate, and a fragmented management approach to assets across central government. The investment strategy developed in 2018 incorporated a robust and scientific approach to our office portfolio. It provides a basis for high-level decision-making across the portfolio. It supports scenario planning, scenario planning based on the level of investment available, investment standards, fluctuations in occupancy, such as we're seeing currently, the mix of freehold and leasehold properties, market conditions, and ultimately, the investment strategy supports a holistic approach to portfolio management. The investment strategy carried out a comprehensive review of the then performance of the estate, including condition surveys of our assets, space utilization studies, fitness for purpose assessments, 
and compared the operational running costs in relation to other properties within the portfolio. In 2018, the investment model concluded that there was a surplus of 210,000 meters square of net internal area or NIA. And that ideally circa 237,000 meters square of net internal area should be disposed of or exited. The investment model showed that this would lead to a shortfall in office space of circa 27,000 square meters. As assets in this portion of the estate were identified as being at end of lease, end of life, or no longer fit for purpose. The investment strategy also identified key metrics in the performance of the estate, namely the significant difference between leasehold cost and freehold cost. The freehold cost of the estates, the average cost of FTEs, was £2,262 per annum. The cost where recent refurbishment in a freehold asset took place reduced that cost down to £460 per FTE per annum. In our leasehold estate, by comparison, the average cost of FTEs was 5,070, the average cost per FTE was 5,074 pounds. The investment strategy provided a framework for investment across central government's entire office portfolio and has become a key tool in controlling lease event related activity across the entire estate, promoting central management of the estate in conjunction with the existing property controls. In regards to our progress to date, since the committee was last briefed on the RPM program, the program has made measured progress. The, the aforementioned investment strategy was developed and implemented in conjunction with the property controls. We've acquired a short-term lease at Nine Lanyon Place. This intervention reduced our net internal area within the associated assets of 25,069 square meters to 13,000. 570 square meters, realizing a savings of 2.7 million pounds per annum. We've also acquired James House as a freehold asset. And this uh, intervention has reduced our net internal area with, again, from the associated assets from 14,526 meters square to 9,525 meters squares. Uh, this project, when completed, will ultimately realize a savings of 2.8 million per annum upon completion. This is also additionally and notably that this intervention will significantly reduce central government's reliance on leasehold properties within Belfast. We're also carrying out a refurbishment of an existing freehold asset in Orchard House, and that will reduce our net internal area from 10,037 square meters to 5,317 meters square. This will ultimately realize the savings of £1,083,000 per annum upon completion. We've completed a pilot demonstrating new approaches and new ways to use office accommodation in Goodwood House. Further work is required, however, because evidence has, is proving that um, increased costs associated with rent and inflation in terms of uh, property-related costs such as energy and, and maintenance have and will continue to erode savings if we don't continue to work to uh, uh, drive further savings. Since 2018, RPM has widened its focus from the technical aspects that realize estate rationalization savings and have evolved now to encompass softer aspects such as establishing an NICS culture that promotes work as an activity rather than a place that we go. These softer aspects bring additional benefits, such as improvements in how work is done, improved diversity, improved work-life balance, health and well-being, and potential improvements in sickness, absenteeism, and productivity. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought about a step change in the way of working and how the NACS uses its estate. From March 2020, the NACS has successfully mobilized to deliver many of its services remotely. The NACS is now presented with a generational opportunity to introduce new ways of working that will support the, uh, that will support the realization of many cross-departmental program for government benefits and outcomes. Overall, the appetite among staff and departments for a blended approach to remote working across the civil service is significant, as supported by the recent NISRA People Survey and the Qualitative Survey completed by the Department of Finance. 
While the current level of remote working is neither practical nor optimum, looking to the future, some business units have suggested that their new operating model may consist of up to 60% of staff working outside of their traditional office on a blended model approach. The Civil Service Recovery Plan has programmed to work with departments this year to support them in the realization of new ways of working. Clearly, the central government office of state should reflect the ongoing reform. Given the detrimental impact of COVID-19 on local economies and the executive's aspiration for a green approach to recovery, it is imperative that the NICS office of state works to realize cross-departmental PFG outcomes and objectives. To that end, the office of state investment strategy is currently being refreshed to consider the following. Firstly, the continuation of the best practice embedded in the, existed investment, the existing investment strategy, namely the asset management science-based approach that was applied in the 2018 investment strategy. Second, to work to the extent possible to continue to reduce revenue pressure within public spending, i.e. continue to reduce our property-related costs. Three, support local economic recovery. Four, support local regeneration. And finally, five, minimize the negative impact of the estate by working towards the net zero agenda. To that end, the investment plans for the NACS Office of State will focus on a reduction of the overall estate while maximizing the local economic and regeneration benefits and working to minimize our environmental impacts in towns and cities across the region. We're promoting a joined up, we're promoting joined up government by working with local councils to the extent possible to ensure that the impact of investment within local council areas best reflects the needs of each area and maximizes value to the public purse. Support today across council chief executives has been encouraging. In addition, Connect2 hubs have been established, which provides strategically located work and collaboration space for NICS staff. Connect2 facilities will support new ways of working allowing staff to work remotely whilst connecting to people, technology, and the office place. An, implement, an implementation plan is being rolled out with the first Connect2 is expected to open soon, subject to public health advice and the executive's recovery plan. How were the, lo how were the Connect2 hubs located or how did, how did we choose the locations? NICS staff postcode data was evaluated in conjunction with spatial data provided by Ordnance Survey. By overlapping the first three digits of staff postcodes with their associated head office, Ordnance Survey was able to identify commuter corridors and densities of staff in terms of their home locations. This was then cross-referenced with our existing portfolio and our investment strategy to determine potential locations for our hubs. Connect2s will primarily focus on utilizing the existing freehold estate, albeit not necessarily exclusively limited to it. The revised investment plan will provide a strategic balanced approach to the management of central government's office portfolio. It's important to note that the plan does not promote the wholesale decentralization out of, of departments out of Belfast. It's envisaged that there will always be a significant NACS presence within Belfast city centre. In conclusion, Chair, the RPM program is taking a balanced approach to investment by working collaboratively across central and local government in order to reduce future revenue pressure help address regional imbalance, promote economic recovery, and responsibly manage our impact on the environment and support the ongoing reform within the NACS departments. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to address any questions you may have. Thanks, Derek, and thanks for that very comprehensive brief. Gemma, do you want to come in? Chair, Chair I'd like to make a proposal, if I might, at this stage. Sure, yeah. uh, Mr. Kennedy was asked to provide the normal courtesy of a written statement in advance to this committee so that we could come here today having read it and ask intelligent questions. Mm. The department failed to do so. We came here today and we got a speech where he threw lots of facts and figures at us. Frankly, we cannot do our job of scrutinising on this basis. I would like to propose that Mr Kennedy provides the document he read from and that he is instructed to return next week to answer any questions we might have. Is there anybody who wishes to second that proposal? Oh. Yes. It's from Jim L. Second. Okay. Uh, I think, Derek, uh, 
we were not given a written brief, and it's obviously you read a very detailed brief out to the, the committee as we came through. And obviously, one of the things we would like to have had would have been the opportunity to scrutinise that in a degree of detail. And there was, your briefing was very detailed. Uh, I think, uh, and again, I, am, I must admit, I am minded uh, to accept the both proposal and the Secretary's approach to that and ask you to uh, provide that written brief to us. And we would then ask you to come back and, and talk to us when we had a chance to have a, some more, more detail on that. Is there some particular specifics in that that you you raise? That looking at the Northern Ireland Audit Office report, and I was reading the report at the same time as you were speaking to check up against some of the things. I would like to have the opportunity to examine the two things in comparison together, particularly to do that, and also indeed with some of the other information we have received, particularly to do with proposals for uh, remote working and the business with business hubs as, as well. I will put that to the committee. If uh, it has been proposed and seconded that we ask you to submit that as a written brief to the committee, and uh, if that is the case, I would ask the committee all those in favour say aye. 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 I think that is agreed. So, uh, Derek, if you could provide that to the committee, and we will reconvene at a uh, convenient date. Okay. Absolutely, Chair. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Neil, could you scare a baby? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, there was. Look, um, sir, and uh, sir, thank you, uh, Jim, for bringing that to the to the committee. But uh, there was a written brief. He was obviously written re reading off a written brief, yeah. and it's a considerable amount of detail on it. And uh, I must admit, trying to read that at the same time as trying to try in the data with the Northern Ireland Audit Office report, I was having the words uh, degree of inconsistency to do yeah. with as well. Okay. Chair, Chair, if I could just Go ahead, Mr. To, to back you up there as Chair and also the proposer of the, of the uh, decision there, I think there's standards here mm -hmm. and there's principles here as to what our job is and our role is and the scrutiny that we uh, the, the fulfil under duty. and. You know, there are just basic standards, and I, I think we have to abide by them. And if we erode that, accrue that in any sh any way, then before you know it, the department will be doing this in every aspect, in every topic. So we have high standards here, and I think we stick to them. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? No, I think that's. I think it's a, a, a completely fair, reasonable request. Can we okay. ask, try and ask him useful, intelligent questions? Okay, thank you very much. Indeed. Move to the next item of the agenda. It's oral presentation, uh, assembly research from RAIDS on the UK Internal Market Act. And if we can bring uh, Aidan onto the spotlight, please. Hi, Aidan. Yeah, we can, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'll just want to share my screen and hopefully that works too, and then I'll get on with the presentation. Yep. Okay, just allow me to just quickly say the following papers are relevant to this agenda item. Uh, the raised paper on the UK Internal Market Acts, page 214, and a response to the committee's query regarding the UK Government's recovery loan, recovery loan scheme is on page 251. Over to you, Aidan, please. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Hopefully, you can see uh, a presentation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as you say, Chair, uh, I'm going to speak to you today about the Internal Market Act 2020, and in particular, about how that relates to the protocol. Um, so, within the presentation, I will um, I will uh, outline some important context, which sort of provides a framework for the rest of the, the, the presentation and for the paper in general. Um, we'll look then at what the IMA does. I don't have time to go through it on a clause by clause basis, but hopefully I'll, there'll be time to give you a sufficient overview um, of all the, all of the detail is contained in the paper. And then I'll examine how the IMA <clears throat> relates to the protocol across three um, specific um, categories. So, first of all, on the context, uh, the context, just to state that the findings of this paper are heavily reliant on what is stated in the IMA and the protocol itself, as well as their supporting documents. Now, this has been supplemented uh, somewhat by um, guidance by UK government and the European Union, and as well, uh, it's been supplemented by um, some uh, commentary from academia. Um, 
raise is sought to ensure that the paper does not delve into legal advice, opinion or political opinion by avoiding interpretation. The, com the committee may wish to um, seek our expert opinion or in-house legal advice on some of the issues uh, raised in the paper. And just to, to remind the committee that the, the role of raise here is to provide impartial objective and non partisan research briefings to the committee and to members. Um, just a little bit more, uh, uh, just to, to note that the, this, this paper has been prepared in a, in a complex and unsettled area. There's no meeting of minds uh, between the EU and the UK on the implementation of the protocol, and that this implementation itself is subject to ongoing discussions. Um, additionally, both the IMA and the protocol are subject to legal challenges. Uh, and that the, uh, the, the paper has been prepared in this context and within this context raises has identified potential implications that the committee may wish to uh, raise with the, the relevant departments. So with all that in just, mind... Just come to a stop here, of course, because I am a, a, a co-respondent on one of the legal challenges, particularly over the protocol, I should make a declaration of interest. <coughs> and do you want to make one as well, Jim? Yes, indeed. Yeah, Jim, I'll ask her to make a declaration of interest as well. Sorry about that, Ian. We just wanted to make okay. sure we got that right. No problem. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay. So, with that in mind, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to what um, the IMA does. Um, so, before I get uh, to provide some detail on that, I just to uh, talk a little bit about its purpose. Um, as per its explanatory memorandum, the Act was designed to uh, preserve the United Kingdom's internal market as powers previously exercised at European level return to the UK. So the Act is divided into eight parts, and amongst other things, these parts introduced market access principles for both goods and services. So essentially these principles um, sought to seek to ensure that a good or a service that is legally for sale in one part of the UK can be legally for sale in other parts of the UK, and that regulation in one part of the UK cannot discriminate against a good or a service from another part of, of the UK. The Act also contains provisions for the recognition of professional qualifications across the UK. It contains provisions which provide new powers to the Competition Market Authority to um, oversee the UK internal market. And it contains uh, a number of provisions which deal directly with issues arising out of the protocol. These include Northern Ireland's place in the UK internal market and the UK Customs Territory, provisions dealing with uh, unfettered access for Northern Ireland goods within the UK market, and provisions which deal with the continued application of uh, EU state aid rules uh, in Northern Ireland. These, these um, elements form the, uh, the, the majority of the rest of the presentation. We'll get to those just in just a moment. Before I do, I'll also point out that the the IMA um, granted uh, powers to UK government to provide financial assistance and to regulate subsidies across the UK. Um, so, uh, section three of this paper um, it sought to identify those um, provisions uh, of the IMA which have uh, which are related to the protocol and which have implications that are related to the protocol, and it did so uh, uh, by. And then categorise them into uh, three distinct categories, and that's provision. The first category is provisions which affect the flow of goods across the UK, and in particular from Northern Ireland to GB and from GB to Northern Ireland. And that's an important distinction because the the IMA uh, treats the flow of goods differently. The provisions of the IMA treat the flow of goods differently, depending on which direction they're going. Um, and these provisions, which uh, will take up the bulk of the, the presentation. And the second category uh, are provisions which concern, concern the continued application of EU state aid regulation in Northern Ireland. And finally, there's a third category uh, of provisions which regard other matters, and these are simply provisions which didn't fit neatly into uh, either of the other two categories, but which have relations to the protocol and are worth bringing to your, the committee's attention. So. If we look at the um, provisions regarding the flow of goods, um, there's three distinct sections within the Act that deal with the flow of goods uh, directly. Uh, first, off, first of all is Section 11, and Section 11 forms uh, part of the wider part of the Act that deals with the market access principles for goods. So to reiterate, the market access principle for 
that's or twofold. There's a mutual recognition principle, which holds that any good lawfully sold in one part of the UK is automatically lawfully for sale in all other parts of the UK. And there's a non-discrimination principle, which holds that statutory rules or regulations in one part of the UK should not prevent goods from another part of the UK from being sold. So what Section 11 seeks to do is, in the words of the Act, modify the market access principles for goods in connection with the protocol. Now, before it does this, Section 11.1 states that the application of market access goods in relation in relation to the sale of goods in Northern Ireland are affected by provisions in both the protocol and the EU Withdrawal Act 2008, specifically those, specifically those um, provisions in the EU Withdrawal Act that give effect to the protocol itself. Um, so then after this, the Section 11 introduces the modifications to um, the market access principles for, for Northern Ireland. And they, they, they seek to enable uh, Northern Ireland goods to be placed on uh, the, the UK market. And they do so by introducing um, a concept of qualifying Northern Ireland goods. Now, this the definition of qualifying Northern Ireland goods in this, in this context is twofold, as set out in legislation. It concerns goods that are wholly... Uh, produced in Northern Ireland, that's the first definition. And the second definition is what is referred to as Northern Ireland processed products. Northern Ireland processed product products can be goods that are processed in Northern Ireland with component parts that were wholly produced in Northern Ireland or produced in Northern Ireland with component parts that were brought into Northern Ireland uh, through a customs procedure. Um, so the market access the, 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 the IMS states that the market access principles uh, apply for goods that fit the definition of a qualified Northern Ireland goods. Um, in, uh, uh, they, do not, um, they do not apply to, uh, to goods that fall outside of that uh, definition. Um, this, is, th th this is focused solely on the movement of goods from Northern Ireland to GB, and there are no similar provisions in the IMA uh, for GB goods in Northern Ireland. It's also important to point out that the current definition of qualified Northern Ireland goods is seen by the UK government as a bridge to a longer lasting regime. They have stated their intention to uh, introduce this longer lasting regime in 2021 and have stated this will be developed uh, alongside uh, business. Moving on to section 46, which again uh, focuses on the flow of goods. This uh, concerns Northern Ireland's place within the UK internal market and UK Customs Territory. Uh, it's focused on the free flow of goods between GB and Northern Ireland. And it states that authorities must have special regard for Northern Ireland's place in the internal market and customs territory when exercising a function that implements the protocol or a function which facilitates the implementation of the protocol. Um, the explanatory memorandum that accompanies the IMA explains that this article, sorry, this section, section 46, supports article 62 of the protocol, which states that having regard to Northern Ireland's entitled place in the UK internal market, the EU and the UK shall use their best endeavours to facilitate trade between Northern Ireland and other parts of the UK in accordance with their applicable legislation and taking into account their respective regulatory regimes and it's, it should be pointed out that the UK's applicable legislation and respective uh, regulatory regime includes the elements of EU law that apply in Northern Ireland via the protocol and its annexes. And then finally, on the flow of goods, uh, section 47 um, concerns uh, on credit accidents from Northern Ireland goods moving to GB. Um, so this states that the appropriate authorities should not exercise their functions in a way that introduces a new check on a qualified Northern Ireland good moving from Northern Ireland to GB or which causes an existing check to be used in a new way. In this context, um, qualifying Northern Ireland good has the same meaning as outlined in Section 11. That's something wholly produced in Northern Ireland or Northern Ireland processed product. Um, important, or, uh, it's important to point out that the article does not pre prevent checks, uh, so the, the section does not prevent checks on goods moving in the other direction from GB to Northern Ireland, and there's no provision, equivalent provision in the IMA to prevent, to, to, that prohibits checks in the same way from GB, 
on goods moving from GB to Northern Ireland. Um, the, 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 the specified prohib- prohibition is also not absolute in that the section allows for checks in certain limited circumstances. For example, um, checks are allowed uh, where they are required by virtue of the UK or the EU's international obligations. Um, so there is a figure on page uh, 243 and presented uh, in front of you uh, now. Um, hopefully you can, you can see that okay, but uh, it's in the packs of page 243 if not. This is an attempt to provide a summary of what the IMA provisions do uh, with respect to the flow of goods. Um, again, uh, what I'd like to draw the, the, the committee's attention to is the, the, the way the IMA provisions treat um, goods flows differently depending on the direction. So again, we see that uh, section 47 prohibits new checks and the new use of uh, existing checks on goods moving from Northern Ireland to GB. There's no equivalent provision on goods moving the other way. Um, although these goods uh, move movements should, uh, the authority should have special regard for Northern Ireland's place in the UK internal market and customs union, as well as facilitating GB uh, to NI trade when exercising its functions, and this uh, this this phrase "special regard" is something that I flagged up in the paper that the committee may wish to seek uh, further opinion uh, on, uh, either from expert witness or perhaps from uh, uh, the, 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 the departments, the relevant departments. So moving on quickly, is the sections of focus on state aid. Uh, there are a number of these. Uh, uh, section forty eight places a requirement on the UK government to publish guidance on state aid in Northern Ireland with respect to Article 10 of the protocol. This was published uh, on the 31st of December 2020, and I've included a summary of what that guidance said with regard to Article 10 on, as an annex to the paper on page 249 of the PACS. Section 49 states that only the Secretary of State uh, can notify the European Commission on state aid with regard with respect to Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, um, the UK government has stated that this reflects the status quo in the sense that that function was carried out uh, by the Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth, and Development Affairs, whilst the UK was a member of the EU and throughout the transition period. Yeah, just to, just for a quick one, just to, for clarification, that that means that it's this, it was the status quo as was. Uh, pre uh, des- uh, end of December last year. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's not really the status quo. It's what it's at the at the last at the last fixed point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Apologies for not being clear there. Yeah. Um. So uh, sections fifty to fifty three also uh, look at state aid or have potential state aid implications. Section 50 and 51 provides UK ministers with the power to provide financial assistance across the UK, including assistance for the purposes of uh, economic development. Section 52 and 53 provides the UK government with the power to regulate subsidies across the UK. Now, the explanatory memorandum notes that this subsidy power is subject to Article 10 of the protocol it does not state the same with regard to the financial assistance powers. Um, and then there's the, the two sections of the IMA, which I've put together in this other catch-all section. Um, uh, they are section 30, part 9, which clarifies that the role of the um, competition market authorities, uh, Office of Internal Market, will not include uh, uh, the IMA provisions that give effect to the protocol. And then section 55 of the IMA sets out the legislative processes which will take place should Article 5 to 10 of the protocol cease to apply. And essentially this means that should those articles of the protocol cease to apply, certain aspects of the IMA will also cease to apply and certain aspects of um, the European Union Withdrawal Act will also cease to apply. That's uh, that's me. Apologies, that's a, that's quite a long uh, presentation. Uh, there was a lot to unpack there, and hopefully we will be able to unpack a bit more in, in questions. Thank you. In just just for clarity, and you might not have the information on this, but obviously 
if there's already been changes where we're 109 days or 110 days on beyond now with the implication of the protocol and the protocols in place. But there's already been shifts in how the United Kingdom is looking at applying state aid in other areas throughout the UK. So the difference between where the UK is now and where the UK was 108 days ago, that is a, that is that is already an area of contention because there's because we're applying what would be the view of the state aid to the status quo back in December rather than the, the where the position where we are now. Is that your understanding? Oh, um, sorry, Chair. Uh, I don't quite understand. Uh, you're saying that. Stadiums moved on from the, the time. Yeah, basically, 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 the UK government's now made some particular things to do. You'll see that it's already doing stuff in the steel industry, and it's also doing other areas of industry. It's doing support. That is obviously decisions it's made after the end of the 30th of December. So, yeah. Northern Ireland would, by implication, if we were fully part of sort of um, the UK's process, we would be uh, subject to those state aid rules. However. Within the implications of the IMA, we are supposedly uh, at the status quo as we were on the 30th of December, the, because the, the, because the the ground has already shifted. So that's yeah, sort I, of the implication. I, I, and if I, if I just ref, if I guess it's good to refer you to the um, the UK government's guidance um, on um, on Article 10 that are published in December, um, where it's stated. Um, apologies, just to find the correct. Uh, Crack use of terminology here. Um, yeah, so it's stated in that guidance that um, in relation to the continued application of state aid in Northern Ireland, that public authorities should take the steps, should continue to take the steps that they would have taken before the 1st of January 2021 to comply with state aid rules. And they also advise that with respect to Northern Ireland, uh, they also encouraged the use of support on a no aid basis, such as commercial loan guarantees and noted that subsidies that have a purely local effect would not constitute a state aid. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, Jim? Yeah, um, first of all, could I thank you for the paper? I, think I was <laughs> impressed by it in terms of its detail and uh, indeed its clarity in, in uh, the manner in which it approached these, so very much appreciate it. Um, it's quite clear from this paper that the distinction between the direction of travel of goods is underscored by the Internal Market Act. Sections 11 and 47 uh, effectively provide for unfettered trade from Northern Ireland to GB, uh, but that is not reciprocated because of the protocol from GB to Northern Ireland. And the the only sucker we have in that regard is section 46. Uh, and section 46 uh, is, of course, interesting and probably will itself be litigated, but uh, it does talk about having special, anyone, uh, any appropriate authority, which effectively means any government minister or indeed probably in the case of the border post, any council. Uh, in implementing the protocol must have special regard to, and then it talks about the Northern Ireland's integral place in the internal market, etc. That phraseology, special regard to, is there any significance in the fact, do you think, that uh, when it comes to the explanatory memorandum, the words actually used are the highest possible regard. The words in the Act are special regard, but when explaining that the government has provided the phraseology highest possible regard. Do you think is there any significance in that? Uh, I'm not sure. I, 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 I did notice that, but um, I'm afraid the actual meaning of that um, I'm afraid, the Chair, that that would um, start to stray into interpretation of of the yeah. of the law, which, which I, I, I wouldn't be comfortable doing, nor should, nor should, nor should I be doing. Um, uh, I do. I would. I would just remind um, 
the, the committee that the, the, uh, the research services is uh, engaged in another piece of work where we are um, developing a list of um, um, experts uh, for the committee to consult with regards to um, these sort of issues and maybe within that list when it comes to the committee soon there, there may be some people that could provide the types of um, uh, interpretation that, that the committee is seeking. Yeah, just, just through Jim, Aidan and sort of maybe Matthew might like to come in on this one. Um, special regard and best endeavours are terms that are used regularly in trade, uh, trade treaties and trade deals. Highest possible regard is not something that I recognise, and I'm just checking my sort of uh, lexicon of international treaty law wording that doesn't sort of immediately flash up on me. Yeah. So it does seem to be a it does it's uh, ambiguous to say the least. I think that's why I suggested there probably will be litigation in itself about this. But best endeavours is the phraseology used in the protocol. Um, Special regard is the phraseology used in the Internal Market Act, but when explaining that, then they use the phraseology highest possible regard, which seems to be an, an attempt to indicate that you you can't get anything higher. It's the highest possible regard, mm. but you still have that dichotomy between the highest or the special regard to Northern Ireland's position within the internal market and the compulsions of the protocol, which effectively put it in the EU single market, so that you still have that contradiction at the heart of all of this. Isn't that fair? Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, there, the, 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 the IMA certainly does treat the, the, the movement of goods in different, uh, different directions differently. It's, yeah. Uh, and it's quite clear on the full reading of the Internal Market Bill that it's subject to the market access principles of the protocol. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the protocol has the primacy. Is that right or not? Again, um, I, 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 I that would be delving into to legal interpretation, um, and perhaps it's something the committee may wish to um, uh, to explore with, with legal services or again with um, with, with uh, experts. Well, it could be a number of useful uh, pointers to what things we might follow up. I think there's about 20 of them. Yeah. And certainly I'd be happy to see those that followed up. But thank you very much. Okay, Aidan, thanks very much indeed. Any other? Sorry, Matthew. Thank you. you. Uh, and and um, uh, yeah, that was a very helpful paper. Thank you, Aidan. Um, can I just ask to, for you, can you give us a summary? Um, about what, of what the because there's a, another a, a degree of ambiguity about what the IMA says about goods, uh, NI goods, the treatment of NI goods in relation to um, UK trade deals. Because the, it, could you give us a quick um, view on that? Because clearly the IMA interacts with p theoretical new UK trade deals. And Northern Ireland is in a um, but the anomalous position because of the protocol. So I don't know if that's something you. Uh, apologies, I'm struggling to hear the member. Oh, sorry. Apologies, Ian. I'm not sitting close enough to the microphone. Uh, my question was around um, implications of the IMA uh, when it comes to treatment of Northern Ireland originating goods uh, in UK trade deals. Um, th that's an interesting question, and uh, apologies, not something I, I considered when um, when looking at the the, 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 the IMA. Um, I, it's something I'm happy to take a, a look at f for the committee and get back to you on. Okay. It would be helpful that that, that pl plus the question of whether there's anything in the IMA that um, disadvantages. Not it, it, Northern will be in a different position in the IMA from what you've said and from everything we know in relation to new UK trade deals in relation to goods coming into Northern Ireland, but not necessarily in relation to goods that are leaving Northern Ireland for destinations with which the UK has a trade deal. It would be helpful to understand that, but also 
Northern Ireland's position re trade deals, EU trade deals, one of the potential situations that might be beneficial, it might not be, but might be beneficial is if Northern Ireland has a sort of being a degree of being ambidextrous and its goods can um, can reach markets via both um, uh, trade arrangements that both if you like jurisdictions have. So if you're able that would be something I think for us to follow up on. I don't but I don't know it doesn't sound like you've looked at it in this particular instance. I I don't know that was, uh... Okay. Yep. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Ian. And uh, if we don't have any other further questions, Ian, thank you very much indeed. Can I ask your... one, sir? Oh, sorry, yeah, sir. Just sorry. for myself. So, it, uh, the internal market. If you brought goods in from Europe to Northern Ireland, I'm just asking for myself. Uh, can you bring them back on feathered? In to the whole of the UK market. So, like luxury goods from Italy, I bring them in here. I can now then bring them out and sell them in the UK market unfettered. Um, it depends on the interpretation of the um, qualified Northern Ireland good. And to reiterate that, that includes goods that are wholly produced in Northern Ireland or um, which are Northern Ireland processed goods. So they're processed either with, um, made up of um, components wholly produced in Northern Ireland or um, components that have been brought in via customs procedure. So I, I'm not, I wouldn't like to, to interpret whether they would fall into that, but um, I, I don't think those such sort of goods would be going under any um, sort of processing, but it may be, uh, Again, it may be something the committee may wish to, to explore with with with, um, uh, with experts or uh, or with the, um, the Department for the Economy, perhaps. Well, You'd have to do something to them. Well, get yeah, the stamp here. We right. package them. <laughs> so, what are you proposing? Bringing in lots of sort of jam well, bottles just and the, things you know, and Italian bathroom towels. Anything that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's. Uh, you're always at your yeah, work. right. Okay. And wives. <laughs> Thanks very much indeed, Ian. Thanks very much indeed. We know what Pat's big plan is from now on in. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you, Ian. Thank you. Um, also, want to sort of make uh, the uh, committee aware of uh, the department's respond to the committee's queries regarding the UK government's recovery loan scheme. That's on page two hundred and fifty-one. Again, that was based on, I think it was an article on the FT, wasn't it? Yep. So, obviously, if it was in the FT, one would presume it would be relatively well researched. Uh, sort of, you'll notice what the uh, department's response is. So, basically, they, to, uh, to paraphrase it, um, they think the article, they said the article is wrong. Um, members have right. any comments? I hope they're right. Any further response that members wish to make, or is the committee content to note and share the correspondence with the committees of the Car Economy and the Executive Office? Content to note and agreed. Okay. Uh, also, ask as agreed that the, uh, Peter is exploring the options for the provision of legal advice in respect to uh, the interaction between the UK Internal Markets Act 2020 and the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, in the meantime, are members content to write to the department asking to set out the process that adopted and the measures in taking? in order to ensure that legislation and policy are compliant both with Section 46 of the UK Internal Market Act 2020 and the Northern Ireland Protocol. And also, I think, um, looking in that raised research paper, I think the questions that Aidan raised, I thought were quite mm. sort of germane and might be useful if the Department had a view on those. We'll seek yep. their view. I'm not sure. We'll seek their view. I think there's some specific ones which would do there. Others might sit with other uh, departments, but if they come back and say it's yeah. Department of the Economy or whatever else, we can then sort of ask the Department of the Economy to look at that as well. And they particularly, I think, the Department of the Executive with the uh, uh, Protocol Brexit subcommittee, it might be useful um, with some of those. Or unless we want to write to sort of short circuit the system as to write to the Department of the Economy or info the Department of Economy and info the TEO at the same time. I think that would probably be easier. Okay, content. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Move on to the next item of the agenda, uh, item number nine, written briefing the rates. Small Business Hereditament Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 Small Business Rate Relief Scheme. Uh, the Department of Finance proposes to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by Article 31C of the Rates Northern Ireland Order 1977 
information on the proposed rules is between pages 257 to 261 of your packs. The scheme provides relief of between 50 to 20 per cent for businesses with rateable values less than 15,000. Information including exemptions on the small business rates relief scheme is appended. The Department also makes reference to the treatment of the small scale renewable sector, which is to remain as is pending the development of the new executive energy strategy. Members, do we have any comments? Paul, do you want to come in on about the. No, we'll just wait and see. It's a watching brief at this stage. Okay, dogs. Uh, therefore, team, the, the statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure. Uh, I'll just make sure all the members are in on uh, spotlight. All the members on spotlight. Yes, yep. we are. Starleaf. Starleaf. Oh, what's this spotlight, spotlight here? Of Starleaf. It must have been Freudian slip. I'm doing that. Uh, the members are content. Uh, it's the committee content that it has no objections to the related policy, and that it's also content for the department to make the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Next, with oral briefing, the official statistics amendment order in Northern Ireland 2021. Uh, ask the uh, uh, Assembly Broadcasting to bring on Tracy. Tracy Parr. Hi, Tracy. Can you hear us? Well, so she's doing a Jim Wells. On silent. <laughs> I think we you're, can. On, you're on mute. <laughs> I can hear you. Oh, we can hear you now, yeah. Tracy. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, team, uh, the, ses yeah. the session has been recorded by Hansard. The following papers are relevant to the agenda item, the clerk's briefing note on page 264, the SL1, the official statistics amendment order at page 265, the policy screening document at page 268, and the code of practice for statistics at page 285. Dr Parr, could you give us a quick presentation? Yes. Thank you. I can. Um, I don't need genuinely take a couple of minutes of your time. So I thank you for inviting me to brief you today. So I'm Tracy Parr and I'm Director of Analysis in NISRA. Um, so I'm here to discuss the proposed statutory rule which will amend the 2012 official statistics order as previously made. So the 2012 order was made in exercise of the powers conferred by Section 6 of the Statistics and Registration Service Act 2007. So this act defines official statistics as those statistics produced by government departments, but it also allows a government department to designate in an order other bodies as producers of official statistics. So the 2012 official statistics order listed 14 bodies as, as producers, and these included the Housing Executive, Sport NI, Livestock and Meat Commission and the CCA, amongst others. And all 14 bodies are part of the wider official statistics community working in partnership with NISRA. So the proposed um, 2012 order, uh, the proposed 2021 order will name a further three bodies, the Education Authority, Invest NI and the Labour Relations Agency. And the appropriate ministers have been informed of the decision to be included and that decision has been made by the three named bodies and the ministers are content. The Finance Minister is bringing forward this legislation as the Minister for Statistics and it was at the um, executive meeting last week and passed through. So the benefits, just for your um, your own information, in case you haven't been involved in these kinds of uh, pieces of legislation before, is that being a producer of official statistics, the benefits include, firstly, a recognised status for the statistics produced. Mm -hmm. Some of these bodies are already, already publishing data on a regular basis, and being a designated producer will give them the appropriate recognition for the work they're already doing. Secondly, the official statistics status is recognised across government and beyond, and so this will raise the profile of their statistics and their importance for policy use. Thirdly, official statistics are regulated by the Statistics Authority, and this regulation drives a process of continual improvement in the quality of statistical output with the aim of meeting the ever-changing needs of users within government, research, academia and the wider public. And lastly, the extension of the official statistics community will further enhance the integrity, coherence, trustworthiness and professionalism of the public sector statistical system. So the impact of being designated as a 
producer of official statistics, um, has been discussed in depth with the appropriate pr officials. It does require a proportionate amount of investment by staff and the named bodies as they become familiar with the requirements of the Code of Practice for Statistics, but this will be fully supported by NISRA through the provision of guidance, a programme of training, and on a day-to-day -day basis by the senior statistician and the statistical team in the host departments, which in this case are the Department of Education and Department for the Economy. So it's hoped that the legislation, if agreed here, will come into effect on the 1st of July this year. So that's really all I want to say by way of brief introduction, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Team, do we have any questions? I think we have, uh, we have had a, a surfeit of statistics and information, and we thank you very much <laughs> indeed for your sorry, presence. Oh, sorry, Matthew. Sorry, again, sorry, sorry uh, for being... Um, uh, Thank you, and sorry I was um, for the beginning. It's really helpful, supportive of this. I think it's a good thing for um, for Nisra. Can you um, just give a sense of um, the I mean, at the minute you are? I'm aware of, sort of the statistics authority has particular designations around official and national statistics, and it's a sort of quality control thing. Um, will you be subject to to rules that you aren't subject to at the minute in terms of timing? I mean, I've had some pre previous professional experience of how the ONS does inflation or, you know, inflation data that people, it's, it, well, there was a, having previously been on pre-release lists where, where, where people had restricted access and that's done away with now. Two questions. One, will you be subject to those rules? Will that mean that, for example, you will discontinue giving some officials advance sight of statistics that they get now? Okay, so the Code of Practice for Statistics applies to all government departments and crime bodies already by virtue of the 2007 um, Act. Yeah. Uh, so that applies to NISRA and government departments. So this particular piece of legislation is bringing into the fold, if you like, three other organisations, as, as I've named. Those organisations, as part of the discussions, do realise the implications upon them for the right, for um, they're opening themselves up to the UK regulator, and they will become part of the community which is subject to the code. So you're absolutely right. Those organisations, Invest NI, Labour Relations Agency and, and the Education Authority, understand the, what the implications are, are for the production of statistics from their organisations. Um, the code has three pillars, trustworthiness, value and quality. And the, the specific part that you, relate, that you um, refer to in terms of limiting release before production, before publication, relates to trustworthiness in that the figures as they come out are seen to be released without uh, any internal political with a small p interference. Um, so the organisations understand that and they're happy that it gives them that stamp of trustworthiness. Okay, thanks. Are there any other organisations who have been talked about as potential, um, this, that this could potentially extend to? So. There are a number of statistics which are produced that we would consider our official statistics. So we regularly um, talk to a number of organisations who are aware of the potential of doing this um, that may or may not choose to come into this, this type of um, an order. Um, but having said that, if they don't want to come into this order, there are ways that they can voluntarily apply the code within um, the organisation to uphold as well as they can without the official regulation, um, the trustworthiness, quality and value pillars, um, and we will help them with, with that as well, without them necessarily being named in legislation. And thank you, Sorry, I'm indulging. thank you for indulging my geekiness, Chair, on this, but um, on, um, for cross-border bodies, some of which do produce statistics, Inter-Trade Ireland, Tourism Ireland, etc., are they following the code voluntarily or would there be any means for them to, would they have to sort of align with one or the other um in terms of or or, or do they kind of so to so they're sorry go ahead yeah. so the republic of ireland does not have an equivalent uh um, le uh, code and legislation, although of course their statisticians obviously abide by uh, professional uh, codes of uh, trustworthiness and quality. Um, but no, we don't have any cross-border bodies because it's a UK regulation authority, of course. Um, we haven't gone to speak to those bodies 
specifically and it's, it's a good idea now that there's voluntary compliance which has only come in in the last couple of years um as you can understand right now nizra is fairly busy but yes, yeah. it seems to be something that we should put on our to-do list okay thank you that's fine that's good. yeah sir and i i know from the past that intertrade has made voluntary reports through statistics so i think they're they're already in a to degree complying but it's a, it's a voluntary area but it would be useful if all sort of north south bodies were uh, applying the code because i think that would be quite useful particularly for statistical analysis and looking what we're trying we're trying to do but again thanks thanks very much indeed uh, tracy thank you very much indeed and thank you very much indeed for uh, coming given evidence and giving your briefing today thank you very much indeed thank, thank you. you okay um sir uh, the, uh, members that the rule is subject to affirmative resolution and thus a plenary debate will follow in due course. Therefore, our members, if members are content, is the committee content that there is no objection to the related policy and that is also content for the department to make the rule? Say, are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay. Uh, next uh, item on the agenda is written briefing principal uh, civil service pension scheme amendment scheme Northern Ireland 2021. The Department proposes to introduce an amendment scheme for the Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme. This includes the Classic, Classic Plus, Premium and Nuvos schemes, which were closed to new entrants from the 1st of April 2015. The PHC SPS was replaced by the Alpha Scheme at this time. The following papers are relevant to this agenda item. The Clerk's Briefing about page 326 and the Principal Civil Service Pension Scheme paper at page 327. Jim, would you like to? Yeah, um, this is obviously in line with what we discussed earlier. Yeah. It seems that the, that the department is going ahead, <laughs> regardless um, of what we decide. But I assume that none of that can happen until we make a decision on either primary legislation or legislative consent motion. Uh, no, Chair, this is unrelated. This is yes. a, uh, a technical amendment. The department assures us it's not a statutory rule. And it's just something they were going to do anyway. But, and we've just been asked to note it. But it, but it, but it, it, it goes into detail about the legacy scheme. Uh, so it's assuming that we are going to go down a, a certain route. I think those schemes have already been closed. Um, so they're closed to new entrants. So like some of us would have been in Nuvos before and we're all moved into Alpha. So I think this is about, if I understand it correctly, they're retrospectively um, making a technical amendment. So it's not linked to McLeod or revaluation or anything else. It is, they assure us, um, a simple technical amendment. So, so there's nothing in this that causes any problems with any decision we make on McLeod eventually? That is what the department assures us. Sure. So, I, I, so my briefing note says, refer to the removal of an erroneous reference to the annual accruing superannuation liability charge. The amendment scheme is to have retrospective effect from the 1st of April 2014. Okay, I accept that, yep. Okay. okay. Members, if we're content, if members are content to note, the, are members content to note the PCSPS amendment scheme? Are we agreed? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Moving on to correspondence, correspondence index. Uh, members are asked to note the index page of the 13 received items of correspondence, page 335. Uh, Paul, could you cover the item 12.2, uh, please? Yeah, sure. Which is first up, is that right? It's yeah, it is. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, members, bear with me one wee second. Uh, uh, so, 12.2 uh, then, uh, that's the piece on the former NICS employee grievance HR policies. Can I say that members are asked to note at page 339 further responses from the former employee regarding the HR issues? The clerk has responded to the correspondence, reiterating the committee's position. So, uh, having heard that, can I ask members, are they content to note? Is that agreed? Great. Great. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Orange uh, okay, Deputy no Chair. Problem. Moving on to item 12.3, Department of Finance, financial support of students. Members are asked to note at page 343 a copy of a response to the Committee for the Economy regarding financial support to students. Members, are we content to note? Okay. Great. Great. Minister of Finance, Public Procurement, uh, Common Framework. Members are asked to consider at page 344 responses from the Minister regarding the Public Procurement Common Framework. The Minister states his commitment to use the PPCF consultation 
and dispute resolution to secure the greatest possible access to public procurement opportunities for local firms. The Minister also states he has written to Julia Lopez MP regarding PPN 1120 on uh, reserving below threshold contracts, which can allow localised restrictions to the exclusion of firms from other parts of the UK. The Minister has also provided a copy of the provisionally agreed, uh, agreed PPCF. Do members wish to make any further comment on the Public Procurement Common Framework? I hope they will take note of today's Court of Appeal judgment against the Department of Infrastructure I about understand. the lack of transparency on roads contracts. Uh, I give them quite a roasting. Yeah, can I just? It would be. Uh, I take note of it, Chair, about of the um, of the correspondence rather than the the, the, the court case. Jim just, Jim just mentioned, but the, the it would be helpful to um, get a, to have a, a, a sort of clear commitment from the department that we are going to hear more because there are a number of outstanding questions I think we had on that, and so I, I just be slightly concerned that. We, we have a commitment to advise us, but but we want to be to nail that down because we have some a range of further questions. I think that we're. Um, I also note that uh, I don't know if you're in the bad books, but you're you've you're uh, the greetings change from Steve Steve to Stephen. It's it does change. It regularly changes. Yeah. Some days I'm a doctor. Some you know, days that's something I'm not. that you've done or we've done, but. <laughs> From the department to advise. Yeah, seek the department to further advise. Are we content? Agreed. Yeah. If you, Jim, have you got a link to that uh, Court of Appeal? I've got it. I'll send you something. Yes, please. Thanks. Uh, item 12.5 EU Affairs Manager and Update on Common Framework. Members are asked to note at page 373 updated information on the progress of the Common Frameworks. Are members content to note? Mm -hmm. Agreed. <coughs> Uh, Department of Finance, Fire Safety and Building Control. Members are asked to note at page 3 at 1 from the Department providing further clarification in respect of building fire safety. The Executive has agreed that the, head of, or the Interim Head of Civil Service is to chair a cross-departmental group to consider the MHCLG Building Fire Safety Programme and determine departmental policy responsibilities and the content of a similar programme in Northern Ireland. The Hackett Review rec recommendations are very wide-ranging, including the establishment of a joint competent authority which would work with Building Control, the Fire Service and HSC, as well as new and explicit obligations for duty holders in respect of high-rise buildings, including for maintenance and construction gateway points, of which overall safety outcomes would be rigorously assessed with legal obligations to declare significant changes. Members, this is quite a significant safety issue, so are members content to write again and ask the Department to explain if a similar ambitious programme is under consideration in Northern Ireland, and why the initial correspondence indicated that the programme was urgently required, that was at the bottom of page 393, when evidence the Committee suggested that the risk profile of buildings in Northern Ireland differed from the rest of the UK? Are we content? Chair, that? Go ahead. Chair, Paul. Just on a, I, I read, I've read this correspondence and the correspondence that yep. we had last week, and I had to leave early last week, so forgive me for that. Apologies. But am I right in saying that the Minister is proposing, the Department is proposing, bringing forward a specific bill for Northern Ireland? Building Safety Bill? It, it doesn't say. Sorry, it doesn't say. It doesn't yeah. say it specifically. It, yeah. That, that's what's in the, 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 the England um, proposals. That's what they're looking for at the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Yes. Um, the Hackett Review says all sorts of things, yes. which would be some of which are clearly reserved and some of which are devolved. And I think that's what they're looking at. They're trying to work out what's devolved, what's reserved, what sits in what departments. But exactly what they have in mind is not clear. And yet the initial correspondence said it was urgent. terribly urgent. So. Yeah. And I don't know if it was terribly urgent based on the fact that with the Hackett review there, they realised that there was a whole series of issues that they needed to deal with. Yes. And then when they looked in looking at the issues, and as we have seen in front of this committee, the, the breadth and spread of the or the breadth and uh, spread of these rules and regulations are really significant. Okay. Yeah, and, and I agree to well, um, one thing that struck me was the HS uh, HS ENA. Uh, all about safety, about the person, not the buildings. And so, you know, when you look through this, if, if you're going to, now it did talk about creating a new governing body, 
that would then work alongside all of these organisations. And again, it's just seeing how that all fits into place and then what roles and remits are placed, or responsibilities and burdens are placed on these organisations and this new organisation. It just, I suspect it, to move forward it will probably take a belt. Yeah. Uh, but how, how that ever, what that will look like at this stage, if they can give us any sort of indication. And I, I, I suspect, as the clerk says, they're grappling with it at the present time and we're maybe, I'm maybe being too premature. Uh, but just making sure that, that, that everything is, is sitting in its right place and, and that you can get a clear steer as soon as possible because, yeah, you know, this is relatively important. Um, um, I think I would be... It's one of the things that sort of in my chair of this committee and some of the things that have seen have come from the committee that sort of concerns me a lot is about sort of the differentiation between Northern Ireland fire safety regulations and those in the rest of our nation, and indeed the rest of these islands. And I think I would be minded to ask the department, uh, bearing in mind they did originally say there was an urgent requirement, yeah. is there intent to bring forward specific Northern Ireland legislation in view of the concerns raised within the Hackett Review? And if that is the case, can they give us an indicative sort of timeline and scope of it? Because it was important enough for the head of the interim head of the civil service being told to look at these issues. Yeah, I think it's important enough for the, the department to be considering, you know, what is the what is the direction of travel it's look, likely to do. If you're content if we are content with that. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, if you move on to the next item of correspondence, uh, corrected laying of the land and property service accounts for uh, twenty nineteen twenty. Members asked to note at page 396 a copy of the 2019-20 Land and Property Services Trust Statement. There is an amendment to one figure in the CNG's table. Members, are we content to note? Note. Right. Uh, Department of Finance, Red Diesel. Jim. Uh, yeah. Members are asked to note the Department's response at page 437 to committee query be the use of red diesel for pleasure boats in Northern Ireland. Oh, yes. Not that I've got one. The Department has contacted Treasury counterparts on this issue will follow the response when received. Are we happy to note? I thought you were accusing me of red, using red <laughs> diesel there. <laughs> um, I think that was an issue that several members have been lobbied about and yeah. raised at the committee, so it will be interesting to see what, what comes up. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, strategic Investment Board Social Value and Public Procurement Contracts. Members are asked to consider at page 339 a briefing paper regarding the use of social clauses in public procurement contracts and the promotion of bi-social approach. Are members content to receive an oral briefing by the Strategic Investment Board on this subject on the 9th of June? Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, item uh, 1210, AJ Watson Limited Businesses with non rateable Offices. Members are asked to note at page 443 correspondence regarding lack of financial support for individual, individual businesses with non rateable offices. Uh, members, are we content to forward this on to the Department for comment? Great. Um, Chair of the Northern Ireland Committee, UK Finance Bank Closures. Members are asked to note at page 445 a letter from the Chair of the Northern Ireland uh, Committee of UK Finance to the Committee for the Economy regarding bank, bank branch closures. The committee has written to the Committee for the Economy seeking a joint and formal session from the banking sector. Pat, do you want to say something? Well, not for more than it's happening. Do you know we know that it's happening? We know the costs okay. that it has on it, but uh, they're not going to change their mind. Okay. So are you content to note? On this no, no. Okay, great. Uh, item twelve twelve, Committee for Infrastructure, Port of Vaux Reservoir. Any apologies if I uh, pronounced that wrong? That's Members That's right. Yeah. That's it, right. Members are asked to note on page 447 a copy of correspondence to the Department of Finance regarding the sale of Port of Old Reservoir by NI Water. Anybody wish to make any co comment? The gentleman isn't my constituency, it's North Down, but it is extraordinary that a property that was valued at a million pounds sold for 67,000. And there's Pardon? another uh, at Port of Old Reservoir. It's a large reservoir and wooded estate, but just outside Dunhadee, between Dunhadee mm. and uh, Old oh, Malile. Yes. Um, and uh, I've been to it a couple of times, and it was surplus to Northern Ireland Water's needs. And like a lot of these small reservoirs, it was sold. Uh -huh. And then uh, it's transport was sold for £67,000, which is an extraordinary <laughs> figure, given the size of the area. And uh, I've only raised this because I know some locals have raised it with me, though it's not, say, South Down. 
It is taxpayers' money because, obviously, at some stage under the old Northern Ireland Water Board, this was purchased and, and created, and then flogged off for for, for pittance. Uh, and there's there's a bit of local concern about that because they feel that the taxpayer could have gained far more um, for for that sizable land holding. So, I mean, I'm tra I'm tra tramping an, an area here that's not really my business, of truth being known. But I did raise a few eyebrows when I read about it. Was it not blighted in some way by yes. the uh, pressures, uh, the work that's going to have to be done under the Reservoirs Act? Reservoirs Bell. One, uh, just for clarification, it's sort of an inspection of our reservoirs about 30 grand, isn't it? I think from sort of the sort of course. But that still doesn't. That takes it to 97,000 rather than. But in the open market, it definitely would have, uh, you know, the bid would have been much higher. Why did it not go to the open market? Well, this is what the locals, let's be honest, the locals are concerned because they have been using the walkways around it yes. as a sort of a local recreational area and fishing. And their concern is now that it's gone into private hands, sold from, by Northern Ireland Water, that will be closed. Um, and that has created the outcry. Well, at that sort of money, the local council could have bought it for, for pittance. Yeah and perhaps have used it for some form of recreational activity. Uh, we have a similar situation, corporate lock in South Down, exactly the same situation arose. The council bought it for a knockdown price, and it's now a very much used um, recreational facility. And they don't understand why the same didn't happen at Port of O. And um, you know, I, I, it's absolutely none of my business, but I just felt that it was a, an extraordinarily cheap price for that land. It is our business, as the finance committee, yeah. isn't it? Um, was it, sir? Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, was it a compulsory? Sorry, apologies. I'm just, I'm just reading the, the sort of the water uh, board. They compulsory purchased that land, oh, and the landowners that lived around it, they have to go back to that original price. That this was goes bought back. At. Yeah, it's, it was back to hundred, hundred plus years. I mean, this has been there. Well, the seek mm -hmm. out those. Those that had ownership of it, so I believed anyway. Sold at the at the market. Not, not ownership, <clears throat> but their heirs and those that were in their estate well, as I it passed on. I don't it think wasn't to the original part, people that were bought. I'm not defending. I'm just as I read it. That was the re they were compelled to go back to the heirs of the original uh, sellers of the land in order to offer it back to them. Uh, I agree with you. It, it seems to be an awful waste because there seems to be an awful lot of people that went there for walks and used it, and I'm in agreement with you. Jim, just to, just to, and sort of, uh, sort of um, um, apologies, but I'm just reading through this again. The um, decision, the sort of the Northern Ireland Water has advised that the decision to agree to the selling price was agreed between land and property services, and the agent working on behalf of the purchaser was taken by Northern Ireland Water's Capital Investment Panel. Should we be asking the question of uh, land and property services and Northern Ireland Water's capital investment panel on what was the what was the valuation and why did they come up with a figure? Uh, if I may, Chair, I'm, I'm, I, I agree this is a subject of interest and Jim raises very legitimate questions and concerns, and I know it's been forwarded to us. But I would genuinely intrigued as to is this one for our committee? Is, are, are the infrastructure committee looking at it? And if they're not. Then would it more properly sit with the Public Accounts Committee? And just to demonstrate that I'm not trying to shirk work, I'm on the Public Accounts Committee. So if it comes before there, I have to scrutinise it anyway. I'm just wondering whether it's for finance. But, you know, there's just this concern that we, first of all, we, you know, overlap in the PAC work, and obviously we could concern ourselves with lots of. Um, and it's just specific because the correspondence come to this. I mean, the reason we're dealing why with this. Why did the, the correspondence? If I may, to the chair, why did the correspondence come to us? It's copied to us from the committee for infrastructure. So they've written to the Department of Finance seeking clarity. They're look, oh, okay. They're looking because it's LPS. So we could see it, seek a copy, and if there is yeah. further. I think we should. Oh, because Can I think seek a copy of the yeah. of their response. Yeah. 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 So they're going to get a response it, anyway. It, it, it does seem, bearing in mind the sort of, uh, bearing in mind North Down. 76.23 acres of, um, no matter what it is, if you sort of drained it, it would be worth a considerable amount of more money than that. Yeah. It's actually group support on reflection, is what you had said is. Um, I don't think it was a case, uh, Pat, of selling it back to the original landowner. It was a deal no. done by a private individual and his agent with Northern Ireland Water, and then it came out, it was sold at 
a ridiculously low price. I just wonder, was the local council consulted with the potential of paying that uh, slightly more and having it as a, a recreational facility for the local community? I understand now that gates and wiring has gone up and there's concern that local access, which has been granted on a sort of a, an ad hoc basis, will now be denied. Okay. Um, I, think it, I think it's worthy of asking. We can turn to... Yep. Okay, thank you. Agreed. Uh, next item on the agenda, Minister of Finance decarbon decarbonising road transport in Northern Ireland. Members asked to note at page 461 a copy of the response from the Minister of Finance to the Committee for Infrastructure re decarbonising road transport in Northern Ireland. Are we content to note? No, no. Agreed. Oh, sorry, I missed one. Sorry. Uh, 1213, Committee for the Executive Office Shared Prosperity Fund. Members are asked to note at page 455 a copy of correspondence from the Executive Office re the Shared Prosperity Fund. Are we content to note? Great. Uh, 12.15, Composite Report. Wow. Members are asked to consider the Composite Report, page 462. The, is the committee content that the Composite Request is an accurate and complete record of the committee's information requests? Are we agreed? In addition, thank you. Moving to the Forward Work Programme. The Draft Forward Work Programme is at page 471. Uh, do members have any comments? Uh, the committee staff have been in contact with the US Consul General regarding a brief from the Congressional Budget Office, and contacts are still being pursued with the OBR. Uh, the Department has asked, to, uh, are we uh, just to keep you informed of that? And the Department has also asked to delay the briefings on the main estimates until the 2nd of June. Members are content with this. The associated raise briefing will also move to the 26th of May 2021. Yeah, content. Are members content with the forward work programme with this amendment? Mr. Chair, we'll be taking um, reform of property management next week, so that will make it a little bit heavier. But, yeah, yeah, cool. but at least we'll have the paper. Well, we well, have the paper in front of us. We should have the paper in front of us. Yeah. <coughs> and, okay, are there, is there any other business? Thank you very much indeed. The date and time of the next meeting next uh, in here at uh, 1400. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, members. Thank you. the meeting. Two, two, three, yeah.